What is threat hunting? This is a an interesting topic to talk about because there's a lot of discussions around what is threat hunting? How do I perform threat hunting? How do I effectively look for these bad actors that are either trying to target my organization or perhaps are either already in my organization? And in this short video, we're going to go over some of the, the primary and basic concepts of threat hunting how you can perhaps employ a threat hunting methodology within your own organization. And then we'll talk about how ArcSight Intelligence really helps that threat hunting process by providing you with the information that you need to begin a threat hunt, as well as to really understand what is going on from your organizational um, internal threat landscape perspective. My name is Rob Brewer. I am the Senior Security Operations Architect International for CyberRes. And let's get into the video. Uh, I think it's really important to start out by covering some of the more conceptual theory side of threat hunting. So there's no real single definition. And if you go out to uh, search engines and you look for threat hunting, you'll come back with millions of results about this is what threat hunting is, this is what threat hunting isn't, here's how you perform it, here's how you don't do it. And it can be quite a confusing place to live in if you haven't already built a capability to do threat hunting or if you don't have an awareness of maybe where to start with threat hunting. And there's a couple of key methodologies that you'll likely come across when you, you go off looking for threat hunting. And they come under different monikers and different names, but primarily they are the two key ones are around intelligence driven. This can also be referred to as analytical driven or alert driven. And then you have hypothesis driven. It's important to understand that these different methodologies aren't mutually exclusive. You don't have to do one or the other. In fact, what we actually do here is we employ all kinds of methodologies to, to hunt for threats within our customers' organizations. And there are pros and cons to each of them, which we'll cover shortly. But really, it's about understanding the, the benefits of one versus the cons of another and how they can play into each other using either a tool or a tool set to give yourselves a better chance at performing threat hunting and finding things before a threat actor or a piece of malicious software has a chance to perform its objectives, whether that's ransomware, data exfiltration, um, IP theft, whatever it may be. It's important to, to establish that the threat hunting is, is really trying to ascertain things that are in progress rather than just something that has perhaps already happened. The other thing to remember about threat hunting is that it is or tends to be more resource intensive than other detection methods. So when you look at a classic solution which will alert when certain conditions are met, that is a known quantity. You can definitely say that when these things are met, the solution will trigger an alert and you can start investigating off that. Now, a lot of that work is done by the solution. And that is the thing that will look at the data, it'll assess what's happening, it'll take into account thresholds, and then tell you when those conditions are met. Now with threat hunting, there's a lot of human interactivity with threat hunting because there isn't always a known thing that is going on. There isn't always a known set of conditions that have been met that allow you to automate some of that. So it does tend to be more resource intensive. It does require sometimes some specialist skill sets, um, but there are other tools out there that, that we provide that really kind of guide people on how to perform that threat hunting exercise without needing to really know a lot of detail from the get-go about what a, th what a threat hunting program may look like and certain search queries and all the complexities that go with it. Now, that's not to say that you don't need that, but initially, if you want to get somebody off the ground quickly in a threat hunting capability, having a tool that allows you to very easily get up and running within the threat hunting exercise is incredibly important. And one big thing that plays into threat hunting is, of course, threat intelligence. Now, threat intelligence isn't always just a threat feed. Now, a threat feed is something such as our GTAP, which provides you with a set of verifiable, reputable indicators of compromise or indicators of behavior of things that are known out there. So a malware actor has performed an action and we now know that these are the sort of files that they use. These are the sort of domains or IP addresses that have been used in those operations. 
So you can look for those identifiers in your organization to determine whether something has already happened. Now that's great, but it's also coming from that known perspective. The way threat intelligence sources, as we can see here, really help is around understanding wider what is out there that may be targeting my organization. And some of the external sources that you can look at, and this is also referred to as OSINT or open source intelligence, are things like social media. You know, social media is a great resource to understand what is happening live, um, not just within cybersecurity, but within general geopolitics or news. You'll tend to find that places like Twitter will have more real-time up-to-date information because it is the people who are there that are posting this information, the people that are living this right now are posting this information and they aren't bound by some of the restrictions that perhaps a, a news or publishing outlet are bound to by having proper formatting, going through uh, QA processes. And that's not also not to discount the news sources as well. They are a great resource because they have the time to put in maybe more thought into the analysis of what's happened. So providing a breakdown or pulling together different areas of things like social media into a single place that you can go to and absorb that very quickly. Uh, places like GitHub or code repositories are, again, another really useful place to find good information if you're doing a threat hunt to, to see whether somebody else has already posted information up there. IOCs tend to end up quite a lot on GitHub. Um, there are other code repositories that you can also use, but that is one of the more popular ones. And then, of course, threat intelligence feeds, as we just spoke about, are incredibly important. They're very key for being able to, to test the hypothesis to determine whether you perhaps have been compromised already using those known indicators. The other flip side of that is internal sources. So if you have something like uh, existing tooling, so a, a UEBA solution such as ArcSight Intelligence, um, which is looking at things from a different perspective, that can also sometimes raise some incidents or some interesting data that you can refer to when you're doing a threat hunt. Um, internal intelligence, if you have a team that's doing something like malware reverse engineering or you have a digital forensics team, they may also have some info which maybe hasn't hit the public um, domain yet that allows you to search across your organization to determine how widespread something may be. Situational awareness is an incredibly important one and this is where our, our Galaxy product comes in to, to its own and, and situational awareness is understanding yourself and not to kind of uh, phrase the old adage of, of knowing your enemy, um, but really things like the MITRE ATT&CK framework is, is something that was designed to help people understand the adversary techniques, tactics, and procedures and how they operate. And knowing how they operate and who they target, that helps you understand as a business, what is the likely risk of this particular threat actor trying to target my organization? Maybe I'm in medical or healthcare, but this particular threat actor really focuses on manufacturing. Um, is that something I should be concerned about? Uh, absolutely, but should it be the top of my risk register? Should it be the top of the things that I am being aware of? Maybe not. So Galaxy helps form that situational awareness to, to drill down into these are the sort of things that the threat actor is targeting my organization, my, my sector, my vertical, and here's the sort of things they do, which then help inform your, your threat intelligence or your threat hunting teams on the sort of techniques and tactics that they may employ. Uh, In-flight investigations, again, are incredibly important. Um, if you have something that's already ongoing, you can take that information and then um, reuse it within other threat hunts. So where do you start with a threat hunt? Um, now, this is a very simplistic view of, of a threat hunt process, but really the, one of the key places to start is around the indicator. So a threat hunt must perform on the back of, of something, whether that is a hypothesis or whether that is a, an analytic alert that's, that's, that's been generated to say that this user doesn't normally do this. Um, it could be a potential compromise of, of an account. It could be an insider threat. It could be a number of different things. But something needs to be confirmed before anybody really knows whether this is malicious or perhaps benign. And some of these anomalies are flagged and that would then threat, uh, uh, prompt a threat hunter to start investigating. Um, you then need to do an initial assessment. So that is to check for any of the key identifiers of suspicious or malicious activity. So things like threat feeds come in really handy here because that can immediately rule out whether something is malicious or not. And then sometimes you may perform a hypothesis. And this is a, a thought process of going, so we've seen some malicious activity and based on what I've seen, 
this may be the sort of things which are going on. This may be the sort of things which this particular entity, this user, this, this IP address, whatever it may be, this is what they may choose to do next. This is what they may want to do next. Now it's not confirmed yet because based on a hypothesis of things that you know from your threat intelligence inputs. And based on that, you can then do searching to say, I think they may be trying to access our file server. Let's check what's going on with the file server. I think they may um, be about to perform data exfiltration. So let's see if they've tried to access any files lately or have copied a large amount of data to a USB drive or up to a, a cloud provider. Based on this hypothesis, you then you then check to confirm what your thoughts are. And then there, there is a response. Now, this could either be concluded as a malicious um, um, uh, confirmed true positive, or it could be a false positive, um, in which case it, it's, it can be disregarded and lessons learned that this is sometimes what this user does. Uh, and the importance of this human and machine teaming is incredibly key to, to point out. And this is the reason why um, solutions like, like our intelligence solution really does play into its own. So if you think about the amount of data being generated at the moment for a typical organization, and we've taken 20,000 events per second here as a, as a rough figure, you know, that is not a small amount of event data, but it's also not anywhere near the biggest that we've also seen. And when you kind of break it down into the actual single events per day, and an event could be a user copying a file. It could be a user logging into a cloud storage provider. There is a lot of events per day that are generated across an entire organization and trying to distill those events to see those individual one-off strange events that, that may be that, that linchpin, that initial keystone event that says this is now turning into something that is malicious or suspicious is incredibly hard. And this is why machines and algorithms uh, really do help us because they operate much faster with large data volumes. They're able to um, assess, consume, they're able to observe all that data and then come to a determination about the general um, trends or the general ideas about what is normal for an organization, what is normal for a user. Now, where machines don't necessarily work so well from a machine learning perspective is on smaller data volumes. So humans ourselves are very good at looking at something from a small data point of view uh, and um, committing that to memory and then trying and then being able to recall that very, very easily. Um, a, a kind of a, I guess a simplistic uh, analogy is if you show a, a, a young child a picture of a lion once and you say, this is a lion, and then you go to a zoo and you, you walk around the zoo and you, you ask the child to point out where the lion is, it's highly likely that they will get it right. They will be able to point out a lion amongst other animals based on being shown a single picture once. And that is the difference between how, how the human brain operates versus how machines really help. So machines distill all of the data down and provide a small amount of data. And then humans operate with that small amount of data very, very effectively. And it's really hard to spot those unusual, those one-off events, especially if they're not something you're looking for, if they're not something that's known. And this is really where we've discussed that ArcSight Intelligence really comes into its own. You know, it is designed to take all of that data and distill it down, to understand it, to form baselines without any of our users needing to understand PMML or complex mathematical algorithms. It's all built in, it's all there, it all works. And the whole idea is that it gives you just less hassle. It allows you and your teams to be able to say, let's give it a load of data and let it, let it understand what our business looks like. And then it will tell us if things are risky. It will tell us if this user working in this department is doing things which is not normal for A, themselves, but also forming those peer-to-peer -peer relationships to compare them against their peers. And all of this you don't need to do. It does it itself, which is the joy of, of working with intelligence. Um, and peer relationships and peer comparisons are incredibly important. Um, because it allows you to get away from that question of uh, if if I've already been compromised, I'm going to baseline bad, aren't I? Well, if you're comparing against a single entity against itself, yes, it will be hard to determine what is good and what is bad. But just because one person is bad does not mean that their peers will be bad. Will be bad. So they will always be compared against people who are doing similar activities, and it will always stand out. And ArcSight Intelligence was also really made by threat hunters for threat hunters. You know, our team use this tool um, in anger, and they're the ones that are able to pick out these incredibly strange and incredibly difficult to identify events 
and go down that route of threat hunting to understand whether this is something malicious or whether this is something benign. I hope you found this video really useful. Um, ArcSight Intelligence is a really interesting tool. It's incredibly powerful. Um, if you get a chance to have a look at it, then I absolutely would. Um, but if you need any more support or advice, please feel free to contact any of the CyberS team. Um, I look forward to speaking to some of you soon. Goodbye.